argue that the word month doesn't say the moon makes an, an orbit. Or it's hard to argue that the word year doesn't say time of the Earth's orbit around the sun. ancient Egyptians were almost obsessive keepers of records. And one thing that they observed most was the celestial objects. We'd expect them to pay attention and record. Now, how far back? That's a big question. Well, we now have some sites that go at least six or seven thousand years before. There's a megalithic site that has been found in the early 70s, uh, but not understood until lately, uh, that has astronomical alignments. And strangely, the astronomical alignments that it has are precisely the ones you find in the Pyramid Age. So Orion, Sirius, the summer sources, they're all there. It's no more theory. We have evidence that they did it. <laughs> For decades, author Robert Boval has been studying the alignment of Egyptian monuments to key stars. Mohammed Shukba, look, we've come here, and what we're trying to do is get to the Nabta Okay. The most important thing is we get there. Yeah. He is now planning an expedition across the desert to a site called Nabta Playa, 100 kilometers west of the Nile and 30 kilometers north of the Sudanese border. It is the location of Egypt's oldest astronomical measuring device. And when we're there, how do you know we're there? Uh, it's all desert. Yes, it's desert. Every, every place here in Western desert, I know it. If you can, we're going to need a GPS. Yeah. If you can yeah. get one. Yes, I have one. That's, that, that makes me feel a lot happier. The team finds out that permits from Cairo have been delayed. Now we wait. You tell us we wait for yeah. the answer from Cairo. And so in the meanwhile, <clears throat> let's go and see the sites. Let's go and see some of the temples here. Yeah? Okay. Let's do it. The key to decoding Egypt is in the alignments of the temples which changed in different epochs to match the majestic drift of the procession of the stars. We're now here at the Karnak Temple in Luxor. Uh, on this wall we can see the ritual of the stretching of the cord. On the right hand side is the goddess Seshet, represented by a priestess, she's holding a rod and a mallet. And on the other side is the pharaoh. There's a cord looping between them, and what they're doing is that they're aligning the monument to the stars. We know from inscriptions at the Temple of Karnak that they aligned monuments with the circumpolar stars, principally the Big Dipper. They also aligned to the stars of Orion, very similarly to what we also have at Napka. The Karnak Temple, the very center of Egyptian religious activity is aligned to the sunrise at the winter solstice. So as we look down the axis this way, on the winter solstice, the sun will rise along the axis. And in the summer solstice, it will be aligned to the sunset of the sun. So as we have at the Napta Playa, in the circle of the calendrical circle where there is the summer solstice alignment, here we have another example of this similar alignment 3,000 years later. On the expedition into the open desert, Robert Boval hopes to see for himself that these alignments exist in the remote region of Napta Playa. The team prepares by mapping a route they will access via GPS. Jeeps are equipped with supplies for the dangerous journey. The team arrives at the first stop on their journey through history.
In the heart of the El Carga oasis lies a Christian settlement dating back to the 3rd century AD. Original paint graces the ceiling of the chapel, telling the stories of Adam and Eve. What is important here is that at Napta we have a settlement that is 6000 BC at least. And here we have a settlement, a Roman settlement, which is of the 1st, 2nd century. Surely the people here were aware of some sort of origins in the, in the desert. They must have moved around here. They're only 300 kilometers away. And this is a big work that anthropologists have to get into, cultural anthropologists, people who understand how to look for clues within a lost culture. We're looking for a lost culture that could be the origins of our civilization. That's what we're talking about here. Off in the distance, the Christian settlement can be seen. In the valley below, we can see the old riverbed of the Nile, which has migrated over 60 kilometers to the east. How many thousands of years would it take to wind back the geological time clock to when the Nile flowed here? The Nile we know there was here. Before we didn't know. Do you realize what this is? Almost surely the ideas of these people, their beliefs, the way they look at the stars, the way they look at the sun, the way they buried people, comes from here to influence the, the pharaonic civilization. Imagine, now imagine 2,000 years ago. There was a Roman garrison with centurions walking about, and priests, and uh, Roman ladies, uh, carriages, I and mean, it, it's amazing to think that this was like this. People have been here for thousands of years. I mean, we know that. But now you're going to show us caves, you're going to show us prehistoric caves, where there are drawings that tell us that people were here even longer than we thought. Maybe 10, maybe 15,000 years ago. I, I, that's incredible. As you can see, I mean, it's quite amazing. The old road actually strikes a dune. This is a new dune. It's been formed, well, in the last 30 years or so. It shows you how the sand moves fast. The team tests the jeeps in the open desert by heading off to an ancient desert monastery. Along the way, the team stumbles across a large outcropping of stone with obvious layers of stratification. The guide tells the team that the area is an ancient ocean bed. There is water like ripples, and seashells are still embedded in the hard rock, indicating a vast change in geology and climate over the past several thousand years. It's probably petrified timber this on a much la later period, but you can see the shells here. The shell is encrusted, they're millions of years old. We're walking on terrain that is millions of years old. The western desert today is rainless, but in the past it received as much as 500 millimeters of precipitation per year. There were permanent lakes, large springs, and seasonal streams. The most recent wet period was between 130,000 and 70,000 years ago. Then it was thornbrush, savanna. At that time, the area supported many large animals, gazelles, giraffes, buffalo, camels, and antelopes. After that period, it was hyper-arid until 12 or 13,000 BC. 
Before 12,000 years ago, the summer tropical monsoons reached southern Egypt. Precipitation was limited and fell mostly during the summer months. It was sufficient to support small animals and cattle. The small animals could live off the dew. The climate resulted in highly mobile human populations. There are ancient cave paintings in a remote location that may provide clues to human settlements from the distant past. Is this crucial evidence being protected by Egyptian authorities? It's terrible. Terrible. It's priceless. It's priceless. Priceless prehistoric evidence. Look here. Look here. What's this? A dog or a gazelle? A man?